Hi, I'm Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive, the Knitting Psychology Podcast. Cheerfully and somewhat irregularly in business since 2008. Segments today may include what's on my hooks, needles, and spindles, a strategy, something I really like, put a lid on it, oh shoot, and blather. So sit back, put your feet up, pick up your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or dyeing, (laughs) or any other yarny thing you're doing, and get ready to enjoy. Well, hi, it's Dr. Gemma, and I am here in the Prius of Love recording episode 103 of the Cognitive Podcast here on a rainy Monday afternoon. I do believe it is November 7th as I check. Let's see. Yes, it is. And it's 12.57 p.m. It's 57 degrees out, which would explain why I'm sitting here wearing every knitted thing I own, except not really. Oh my goodness, I'm actually sitting here laughing because this couple is walking by and they're both wearing buffalo plaid check onesies and boots. And only in Southern California is all I can say. But I understand because we're all out in the rain and we're Southern Californians. We don't know what to do with this kind of weather. So I am currently wearing my incredibly gorgeous brick sweater knitted last year, I believe, in the Wales Road colorway from Malabrigo Rios, and I'm in love with it. Next to me, I have my knitted hat in the Scuba colorway from Rock and String Yarn. It's a DK hat. I can't remember what this thing is called. Anyway, it's cute. (laughs) And I'm also wearing an insanely beautiful Entrelac scarf I made a few years ago in some Norocorion that apparently I wanted to get rid of, and I had this sitting in a box of give to charity and I don't know why because it goes with everything in my wardrobe. What else was I wearing? I was wearing my Ravenclaw fingerless mitts this morning. They're out of just good old-fashioned knit picks. I would assume it's Wool of the Andes in a worsted weight. I believe they were scraps from some other projects but oh yeah from my vest from my vest that I made of that years ago. So anyway it is wear a lot of hats day and I'm really enjoying it. Wear a lot of knitted clothes, wear all the knits you have because it's damp and chilly out. I hope you're all doing well and I hope you're all having a rainy day. If you want a rainy day, if you live where I do, you do. Let's see what else is going on. Well, warm thanks, the usual warm thanks for all the good wishes for the hubs. We'll get to him in the hubs date. Knitting hiker, Nora the Black Cat is simply lovely, just so you know, and I didn't realize you were over in TO. I don't know why I forgot that, but I'm glad you've got the toppers out there. Minerva would like to salute you for your fine taste in feline companions and actually if Minerva could speak in a language that I could transmit she'd probably instead be saluting Nora the gorgeous black cat for her good taste in having you as her human pet because that's really how cats work isn't it? I almost left out our own Christina H. Thank you for a generous pot of coffee. That helps to keep the podcast going here through the holidays, and I greatly appreciate your generosity as always. Okie dokie. COVID, COVID, COVID alert. (laughs) Get your shots. You've heard it before. I'm really impressed. I had a patient last week trying to talk me out of getting shots, and then I realized... Yeah, he's, he's, uh, his politics are questionable and he would like me not to get a shot because if I would die then his vote would count for more. There are people out there who think that way, kids. Did everybody vote? Did everybody vote? I voted today. I hope you all voted. Because of debacles like the politicization of the COVID vaccine when anybody in their right mind would have gotten one as soon as they could. <laughs> But no, and not in America, we made it political. I just love that. Go get your shots, get everybody else their shots. Remember, it's a vaccine. You know, vaccines, the things that ended the polio epidemic and, oh, have managed smallpox and reduced shingles as a problem. You know, those things that we've been getting all our lives to protect ourselves and our families and each other. Yes, go get your vaccines. In the meantime, you're saying, but Gemma, thank you for all of that. But what's on your hooks and needles? 
Nothing finished. Well, come on. I mean, I just finished all those socks and everything. Have a heart. But in progress is sure fun because Disney Blonde Studios, who will be at Stitches this coming weekend, Stitches Southern, what are they calling it now? It used to be Stitches Southern California. Now I think they're calling it Stitches Southwest. I don't know. It's Stitches. It's in Pasadena. I'll be there on Sunday. If you were there, look me up. But Dizzy Blonde will be there, my friend Laura. And she has two colorways that she's done up in honor of the late Nichelle Nichols, our own beloved Lieutenant Uhura from Star Trek. One is called Hailing Frequencies Open. It's my particular favorite. Predominantly the red of Uhura's uniform with a blast of bright gold and black. And the other one is in honor of the space program, the shuttle program called Reach for the Stars. As you may recall, Ms. Nichols was a recruiter for NASA for quite a while, trying to get uh, people of color and women into the space program. And a lot of astronauts look back to those days with gratitude. She recruited a lot of people who did go up on the shuttle. So the Reach for the Stars colorway is primarily NASA blue with a little bit of a light, I'd call it a dark sage or a light pea green, and then a blast of white. These are beautiful colors. They're available across several weights. I'm ordering them in DK, but I know she's got them in her sock weights. I just want to make a few hats. I do not want to increase my sock yarn stash because it has reached frightening proportions. But I'm always going to buy when she comes up with some new colors at Dizzy Blondes. And this also hits my love of Trek and my nerdness. So if you go over to see Dizzy Blonde Studios at Stitches, tell them Dr. Gemma sent you. And I'm very happy you can see the colorways in the show notes. And you can see the show notes at our group on Ravelry or at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com. So there you go. No love for the Wayne Splitter. I really want to do it. I really am getting to that place. It's cold outside. Today would be an insanely good day to have a wool skirt. I am just saying. And it's only November. We're such cowards here in Southern California. Can you imagine what I'll be like in January when it's actually cold according to most of the rest of you as opposed to our standards? In the meantime, though, things have gotten very interesting with the don't know yet. These are my crochet blocks, one at a time, five by five inches in half double crochet. You may remember that I had so much yarn, we are talking something like 36 skeins minimum, left over in Knit Picks Brava Sport Weight from making my temperature blanket for 2021. I had so many left over, I started just making a block a day thinking, I don't know what this is yet, but I'm going to figure out something to make with it. Then I realized the horror of how much of this stuff I actually had. Way more than I need to make a temperature blanket, but all in the wrong proportions unless I seriously changed the way I did the colors, how I associated them with ranges of temperature at any rate. So there I was last January, and you may remember I started doing a block a day, and I worked backwards to catch up, so I have one a day. All right, on October 25th, we were at 300 blocks. I believe we're shooting for 342 minimum. I'm not far away. I'm probably at about 320 now because if you look in the show notes, you will see a few things. One, I took all my remaining skeins out of that box that's under my desk at my feet. I put them on my desk so I could look at them. This did a couple of things. One, as you can see, there is now a little teeny tiny open space under my desk by my fireproof filing cabinet. That's where some of the yarn was and where the bags of the completed blocks were. So I took all the completed blocks and I put them in the big box that I'd like to get out from under there where the yarn was initially stored. What I'm trying to tell you is I've actually cleared a little tiny space. <laughs> Got a lot more space to clear, but it was a start. And all of the remaining skeins are on my desk and that's really encouraging me. What's actually happened over the last few days is now I'm just wildly crocheting those blocks. Instead of working on my other projects, I have to admit I'm giving a lot of time to just whipping through that leftover yarn and crocheting blocks. But there's even more if you look at the pile of yarn on my desk, you'll see a miscellaneous pile of black yarn over to the right. That is a pile of 19 blocks of black. I'm really excited about this. I need something like 72 or 74 black squares. I forget how many. 
to do the total frame I want to do around this blanket in the squares. So you may remember a few weeks ago, I took 19, since it's looking like a 19 by 19 or 19 by 18, I think a 19 by 19 block blanket. And I took 19 of them and I clipped them together with those handy little clips that look like plastic safety pins. Yeah, I clipped 19 of them together and I laid it on my bed to actually get a sense of how the size is working. Now, it taught me a lot of things. It stretched. It taught me that this blanket is probably going to stretch. I had a little extra space in it because of the space between the squares, no matter how tightly I clipped them. Anyway, it taught me that 19 blocks. Great idea. Okay, then I left them on my desk, clipped together, thinking surely this will be a useful thing to have done. Well, if you look at my pictures in the show notes, you will see the first, really three, but you can only see two of them with a little bit of the third squares of those 19 clipped together. And I started experimenting with joins. And I wanted to try for an invisible join, which is really pretty basically a mattress stitch in knitting. And I found some really nice online tutorials. And hopefully I will come back to those and maybe give you the links to those. Did I? Yeah, I didn't put it in there. But I found some nice tutorials, but essentially it's a mattress stitch. And what you do is you put two blocks face to face, right side to right side, and then you go along the edge with your yarn on a big yarn needle, and you go for each stitch. You line the stitches up, and you pick up the outside half of the stitch, and you make the yarn go, you go under the outside half, over the inside, over the inside of the other side, and under the outside. And that's it. That's the basic stitch. And then you turn around and you come back on the next stitch the same way. At the end, you pull this a little tight because it will tend to loosen up. And then, if you're really lucky, and I was, you will have the leftover beginning and ending strings from that block. And you can tie one of those with each end of what you just used to, knit, to sew them together. So this means you get little knots and it holds the blocks together very nicely and tightly. Somebody, no, everybody has said, but what about all those ends you're going to have to weave in? Well, once you've knotted them, it's not a big issue. But the other thing I would say is, look, if you're going to crochet blocks together and you have a hatred of weaving in ends, you're in the wrong project, sister. <laughs> I, I really don't get upset about weaving ends, and you should have noticed this by now because I do all these scrap yarn projects. You know, those always have more ends than typical. Yeah, I do striped projects. Those always have more ends. I do fair isle. Those always have more ends. If you're a person who quite reasonably does not like weaving in ends, number one, get a daughter or a mother looking at you, Knitmores, who will sit around and do it for you just out of sheer family love. But I don't have that. My husband and son would probably prefer to chew off their own right legs to get out of that trap. So I have to do my own. Second, if you really hate ends and you don't have a spare family member whom you can victim, I mean, whom you can bribe, I mean, whom you can talk into doing this for you, then you know what? There's a lot of really fabulous solid color projects out there. <laughs> Did I mention the brick sweater where you basically just use an insanely beautiful yarn like Rios and it comes in these sort of semi-solids and it takes care of all that beautiful color work and you don't have that many ends. But kids, if you're gonna do granny squares or any kind of crocheting blocks and then try and assemble them, yeah, you got to make your peace with that weaving in of ends. I simply don't care. Uh, I weave in my short ends with crochet. I'll take a hook and I'll just weave the hook through a few stitches and then pull the yarn through with a hook. It's just not a big deal. Try not to let it get to you. Meanwhile, if you're counting, I just said that I'm making something with 340 something blocks. That's going to be a lot of seaming. I know. And that's why I started now was I thought, I really don't expect to seem seriously till Romeo, you know, the time between Christmas and New Year's. But I thought any little bit I do is a glorious thing. And the sooner I get good at this, the faster I'll get, the faster I get, the more efficient I get, the more efficient I get, the faster this will go, the less pain. Now listen to me seriously. Any of you who quilt or sew, 
If you're sitting here griping about weaving in ends, you've just disqualified yourself. Because come on, quilting, seriously, all those little pieces? I know, I'm a quilter. That's why I don't mind weaving in ends. You've done worse than this. So everybody who keeps writing to me about seaming it and the misery and the ends and the weaving in of ends, everybody take a deep breath and remember, I'm old now and I've got more time on my hands. <laughs> no, I don't. But uh, what is true is... I'm not what I would call hardcore in terms of craftiness. You know, I know some of you have been knitting and spinning a lot longer than I have. But now I think my, my knitting started, boy, I'm guessing about 2002, 2003, somewhere in there. So, you know, it's been like 19 or 20 years now. So I'm pretty hardcore. And you do reach a point where you've made everything you want to make. Like I was talking about last week, I've got the wardrobe of beautiful sweaters that go with everything, very simple. I've pretty much memorized the pattern I'm using. I've pretty much fitted it to myself. You know, you do reach that moment, then you look in your sock collection and say, good Lord, I've got socks through the next millennium. And then you realize you're giving away some of your older sweaters to charity. At a moment like that, of course, then you look at your scarves and go, good heavens, I've got millions of them too, and cowls. And then you say, it's time to really slow down and make the really intricate, interesting stuff. And this fits that for me. At the same time, I'm very pleased. I've been yarn fasting for I don't know how long now. Not very. I mean, I, I think it's been about a year since I bought my latest Malabrigo haul. But somewhere in there, I decided to stop and, and just use up my stash. And I'm having so much fun doing that. So this blanket is like 30-something skeins I'm getting rid of. And in a good way that I'm going to use right away on my bed. And while we're on the subject, I've been happily working away on the Lady Eleanor. And that took 11 skeins minimum, although I'm looking for a few more to coordinate. But that's taking 11 skeins out of my stash. They're small skeins. They're Corian, so they're only half the size of like a Cascade 220 skein. Even so. And I'm really pleased. I've added two skeins because I'm going to buy from my friend when she dies. And I always will buy from Lisa Souza if I'm anywhere in her near vicinity. But on the whole, I'm doing really quite well getting stuff out of my stash. And I'm starting to open up space. And I'm really enjoying it. And so it is the time where I say weaving in ends, small potatoes, seaming together hundreds of blocks, small potatoes. Now, having said all that, I would basically chew my own right leg off to get out of the trap if I decided to knit a blanket because they take so much longer. So I am a hypocrite. If you ask me about knitting a blanket, I say too much time, too much effort, too much seeming, too much weaving in events. So there, you've heard me just completely contradict myself. The Wrapped in Tiny Change crocheted cardigan, I really want to get back to that. But again, I'm stalling that because of the use of my hands for ASL. I don't mind doing the occasional small crocheted block, but I do feel my hands burning when I do too much crocheting, and I'm also using those same hands for ASL, and yeah, the two do come into conflict. So for now, I've reduced my crocheting, and I'm doing a lot of knitting. The Lady Eleanor, there is an update pick. I don't know why in that picture one of the squares by the bottom row looks all loose and bumpy. I went through and looked and they all look fine. So that one is weird looking in the picture. But it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. I don't know how many rows I am in, but I'm about 16 inches. And I'm just finishing my third skein. I think I have 11 planned for this. Unless I find something in my stash that coordinates enough to add it. The original recipe calls for about 12 in Corian. It doesn't use Corian. It uses a different yarn, but about that number of yards. So I'm pretty happy with it. It's on track, unblocked, to be about 48 inches. My guess blocked is it's going to be more about like 53 or 54. We'll see. But my experience of Corian is that it really blooms with blocking, soaking and blocking, and then it stretches. So we'll see how that goes. Certainly it's going to be long enough to be the shawl I want it to be. As always, I have a list of my favorite resources for yarns, independent dyers, brick-and-mortar LYSs, online stores and supplies. Dizzy Blondes. Well, believe it or not, if you look, you will see a picture of my fingers holding a bit of Minerva fluff. So every day now, Minerva 
grabs the brush, bites it, mauls it, and tries to get me to pay attention to it. Then she jumps into my lap and waits, and I brush her. And she will allow me to do only so much before she bites me, but she wants to be brushed with that brush. And she's slowly teaching me how she wants to be brushed so that she doesn't feel the need to bite me. So if you look in that picture, you will see the little tiny bit of fuzz I get off Minerva about once a day. And there is my beautiful drop spindle. The person who made these, Yorkie Slave, I don't believe she's making spindles anymore, but it's an extremely lightweight spindle made out of balsa wood, very balanced, and I love it. So I am spinning Minerva on that. That's how much I spin a day. What you're looking at, that fuzz in my hand, that gets me about maybe three inches. So how long is this project going to take? Forever. I'm just spinning Minerva on the drop spindle. Why? Minerva is there, the fur is there, the spindle is there, and I am there. It's just a little tiny thing. It takes, you know, five minutes to brush up that much of her. And that's all you get. She's not shedding right now. And it takes like two minutes to spin it. But it just seems interesting. I will need to wash it. I am spinning in the grease here right off my fiber animal. It's extremely soft. It makes mohair feel harsh. So did I ever think I would spin my blooming cat? No. That is something I would have said is totally impossible to do. But it's an interesting project and I'm doing it. It's a very tight spin. It has to be to the point where once or twice it's gotten so tight I broke it. But it's okay. I broke the yarn, the single. It's okay. It's just something that interests me right now. You know me. I'm always going to be an experimental spinner. I mean, I'm the one who spins dog hair and uses it for scarves. On to the strategy. Well, we're working our way through Dear Man, which is an interpersonal strategy. How do I talk to people? Dear Man is the basic 101 how to tell somebody what you, what you want from them, what you're thinking about, what you want. And we did the D, well, we did the whole thing really fast a few weeks back. And I'm going through it line by line here. We're on E. The E is for express yourself calmly and with assurance. And you're thinking, come on, Gems, why are we talking about this? I mean, this is kind of obvious, isn't it? Yes, it is. And yet you don't do it, do you? Those of you who've had speech training, and I've had a lot of it, and I'm very pleased with that. One of my goals coming out of high school was to become a good public speaker. And I had to really work at it. It took me years of training. And I'm grateful. One of the reasons I went to Stanford's English doctoral program was they did all that. They trained you how to teach. And they trained you how to do public speaking in a variety of situations. I'm so grateful. One of the things I learned, and I mentioned this a little bit with the D last week, is when people are speaking, they just don't think about their audience. And you have to. That's the first rule of speech or writing. So... One of the interesting things here is when people ask for something, they often choose inappropriate mood for their form of expression. So a lot of people, when they say, can you give me this, do this for me, whatever, they whine. Oh, come on, I really need this. When a human hears, ah, 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 we turn off. We don't like it. Whining is kind of nagging. Now, you may have every right to nag. This may be something the other person was supposed to give you or do for you. You may have every right. But that doesn't mean it's going to work. This is not about your rights or what's correct. This is about success. What works? The other thing, when you're expressing yourself confidently. I used to be a professor. We would give oral exams. Let me tell you what we all hated. Student bounces in. You say, how are you today? They go, oh, I'm really scared. I'm really scared. Okay. That's a mistake because now your whole audience feels like a bunch of bullies. They feel like they're victimizing you. I can tell you right now, I learned right away when I had to give oral exams as a professor, here's who you feel good about. The person who walks in and says calmly, well, you know, I guess I'm predictably nervous, but I'm excited to get this done. I've worked really hard on it. And this is a chance for me to talk to my colleagues at an advanced level. That will get you so far with most examiners. Why? Don't make your audience feel bad about themselves. That's why this is so true. Express yourself with calmness, with assurance. Because you have to bring your audience with you. You want them to feel good towards you. 
Here's the other thing I learned. People passed or failed their exams in the first five minutes. Because they did stuff like this wrong. They walked in and they said, I'm really nervous, I'm really nervous, but I'm ready to go. Okay, they weren't ready to go. They were scaring themselves. When you express yourself with fear and anxiety, you're reinforcing those negative emotions in yourself. Your job is to come in professionally, express calm, because it's going to help your audience, but you're in your audience. You're hearing your own voice. You're picking up your own cues. Do not reinforce your own fears by acting fearful. The same is true with anger. When you're angry at somebody and you control that, you're actually de-enforcing your anger. You're giving yourself increased self-control, okay? So the E of dear man is huge, and yet we always gloss over it. When you express yourself to another person, your best bet in managing your own concerns, your own mood, your own reactions, as well as making your audience want to work with you, your best strategy is always to express yourself calmly and with confidence. Now, this is where about a third of you just went, but I don't feel confident. Yeah, fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. Of course you don't feel confident. What do you think, I walk around on a confidence high all the time? <laughs> but your behaviors are part of your programming of yourself. That's why we say fake it till you make it. Go in there and say, I'm going to be confident for the first few minutes. You will feel better. You will improve your confidence just by trying to fake it. Oh, wait, you don't have to fake it. You could rehearse, you know. You could rehearse. When you have a major meeting, now you may not know what you're going to be asked at the meeting, but you can rehearse things like saying, hey, everybody, how you doing today? Everybody feeling good? I feel good. <laughs> you can rehearse your entrance. You can rehearse your opening statement. Someone says, how you doing? Oh, I'm so ready for this. Boy, we really need to do this. This will be great to get through this. I'm looking forward to having this done. Even if you just rehearse that, what are you doing? You're programming yourself to confidence. So the E of dear man in interpersonal strategies, when you want to request somebody, make a point, describe what you want, speak to persuade, you express yourself with calmness and assurance. Let's see, let's see the fluffy books. I'm still carrying Introduction to American Deaf Culture. I need to finish it. I'm on the last chapter. I'm not as interested in the topic of the chapter. It's about deaf culture and the arts, and I'm enjoying the book immensely, but to me, Holcomb, the author, limits the arts to just things like poetry and music, whereas I think there's a lot to be said for deaf culture in things like sculpture, weaving, knitting, but it's a very good start. A Brazen Curiosity, I'm still reading the series on Beatrice Hyde Clare by Lynn Messina. I'm way past a brazen curiosity. That's the first book, but I've got the link to that book to get you started. It's all over Amazon. This is total fluff, and I'm enjoying it. I don't know if Lynn Messina means to make it as 21st century in its outlook as it is, but it's sure fun. I'm still carrying the link for the free textbook that is an introduction to cultural anthropology because I really need to sit down and read it, but I'm still carrying it. I decided not to take there's a month-long intensive winter semester, but you're supposed to watch YouTubes every day and participate every day. And it's all online, so it, it's not timed. I don't have to do it at any one particular time. But I just don't feel like turning the month of January into a living hell for myself. But I'm probably going to read that textbook anyway and take the course eventually. I finished The Sign for Home, a novel by Blair Fell, a hearing author. It's okay. It's a good book. If you want to read a pretty good roundup of the goofy things deaf people go through at the hands of the hearing, goofy is not quite the right adjective. Some of them are painful, some of them are funny, some of them are a little bit horrifying. And all of them involve audism. That is the bias of hearing people towards hearing in ways that are unsupportive of the deaf community. In other words, it's one thing to say, well, if you gave me my druthers, I'd have my hearing. It's quite another thing to say, so I'm not going to grant you access because you don't have hearing. And the interesting thing, Blair Feld did a lot of work on this book. 
I have to give him credit. He really did his homework from what I can tell. He has a lot of deaf and deaf blind people reading the manuscript. I'm very impressed by the work he did. I hate contemporary American literature. Did I, have I ever said that? I hate it. That's why I'm a Shakespeare scholar. I hate it for, I hate this book for all the reasons. I hate all of that. However, having said that, it's pretty good. In terms of literary structure, too much denouement. That it collapses into near disaster about 40% of the way into the book, and then it just stays there for so long that it becomes unbearable. And then the ending is meh, meh. He doesn't really resolve the problem enough to be satisfying. And I also don't believe in it. I believe that the people at the end would all be arrested the minute they hit a gas station. But it's an interesting book. I am reading Death Again, a autobiographical work by Mark Drollsbow, where he talks about being the child of deaf parents and yet somehow getting dragged into being forced to act like a hearing child. And his experiences in the hearing and the deaf world as a result. I'm a little bit paused on that right now because I'm working hard on ASL, so I haven't been reading much about it. My one regret, it's a good book and it's very worth reading anyway. However, it's become a textbook and so it's overpriced. That seriously, this would be a paperback and it would cost somewhere between four and 12 bucks, you know. No, it's a textbook for a lot of schools and so it's gotten into that market. So now it's like 70 bucks new. It's no. Look it up as a used book and enjoy yourself. Really, look it up. Something I really like, voting. Did I mention that? I voted today. I'm very pleased. It was very easy. I'm in California. We have mail-in ballots. I took my ballot down to the highly secure armored box, the drop-off box in the park in my hometown, here in small town mountains of Southern California. And I voted. And I'm very happy about it. I feel very good about it. I am part of Rovember, to be brutally honest. So I feel good about that. If you haven't voted yet, if you're in California, I believe tomorrow is the last ASPE postmark within, within one week of tomorrow, of November 8th, I believe. So you still have some time, but I'd rather do it by mail because I am in a conservative region and the conservatives here make a lot of violent threats against Democrats, people perceived as liberals, whatnot. I felt more secure using the ballot box and dropping it off or using the mail. But please vote. Oh, this leads me into some other things I like. I like tea. I really like tea. And this is a little bit of put a lid on it, really, that it's been a hard week. I was very stressed. I wasn't watching all of my diet. So I ended up, well, let's say the plumbing got a little plugged up. And that brings me on to my winter tea. This is the time of year where I restock right before Black Friday. Because I'm restocking at this time of year on the things that don't really go on sale, like things from Etsy, things like that. So, those of you who occasionally have congested plumbing, may I say, medicinal herbals tea makes a thing called smooth move. And I know, that's really graphic, just in its name, but it's good stuff. It's a licorice flavored, it's all herbs. I have always found that to manage my gut really well. The other thing is I periodically drink goat's milk kefir, just a little bit, a swallow or two a day. Why? I want some fermentation in my gut, but I don't want too much sugar or carb with it. So I get the goat's milk kefir from Trader Joe's. I stopped drinking it, hence the plugging. However, basically a cup of smooth move about once every other day. I also drink coffee for breakfast. I have, that is my breakfast. I have a big mug of hot coffee. I use Rapid Fire's Keto Coffee Instant Powder, and I like that. I'm also eating a lot of the Keto Chow Shakes. They're expensive. Um, they're okay. What I like about them is the convenience. They are pricey. But, you know, on working days, I make a keto shake, usually the day before. I'm using about a half cup of heavy whipping cream and then water. Sometimes I pour coffee. It actually tastes better without coffee. It tastes better with just water in it. But I will mix that up in a blender or in a shaker. And the really great thing, that's a full meal for me. I find it very filling and a little too thick, which leads to other things. So I will make a big 
shaker of that. And then in the morning when I make my keto coffee for breakfast, I just have the keto coffee, but I will pour about a half cup of that, of the keto shake into it as the creamer. And it sweetens it, it works really well. And then the leftover, I will thin out again with a little water, put it back in the fridge, and that will be lunch. So that's been working very well. For those of you who share my occasional habit of plugging up the plumbing, I want to also point out ice packs. I sit on them and aspirin. That with that problem goes a certain dryness and swelling. Frankly, aspirin, I take an asp a single aspirin, not two. I'll take a single aspirin a few times a day. And that solves a lot of that discomfort. And the ice packs, I'll just sit on them. I wrap them in a tea towel and just sit on them in my chair while I'm working. And that works really well. Be really careful because these are really common human issues. And we get into stupid solutions and chemical solutions. Really, guys, there's a lot of good home remedies. Which also leads me to the most idiotic thing I've seen this week. On Facebook, somebody posted, I'm not making this up, toilet paper made out of squares of flannel buttoned to each other to form a toilet roll and then put on a roller like toilet paper. And they said, stop wasting paper and killing trees. You could use this instead. Okay. Anybody else think that's crazy when you could just use a bidet? I'm just saying. But, you know, it does bring up the point that our grocery bills went down significantly when we went to a bideting system. I keep claws around because the bidet system is not always perfect. But I would rather just rinse myself. If you're getting kind of dry because of congestion issues, that also relieves that. The cool water feels good. Okay. So, in other words, I'm, I'm in my head, I can hear Jasmine Nitmore saying, if we don't talk about these things, who will? All right. But I want to say, here in Put a Lid on It, I just want to recommend herbal teas and common sense remedies to minor problems that you know are not big things. Stop running to CVS and buying pills. There's a lot of reasonable ways to handle all this. Also, I have been restocking my tea selection. Well, by the way, if you want to do the bidet thing, tushy, yes, tushy.com. Squeeze bottles you can use when you travel, collapsible, really nice. The ones you can install on your toilet for a reasonable price, all really good stuff. Smooth Move Tea, you can Google that. You can buy it on Amazon if you need to. But also, I happen to be fond of Harney & Sons, a tea company out of New York State that does some really interesting seasonal variants of teas. I do worry when teas say natural flavors because sugar in America, you can call that a natural flavor. Yes, there are companies that soak their tea leaves in sugar. I'm not making that up. So I do try to avoid sweet flavors because I worry about that, about getting sugar from my tea leaves. Stupid but true, it's going on out there. But I like Harney and & Sons and they have some just good old fashioned standards, English breakfast, Earl Grey, etc. I also went to Snarky Teas, a woman-owned company. Now, I like Harney & Sons because they're family-owned. Snarky Teas is apparently woman-owned. And I got a filter for my iced tea that I decided I've been using a, a really nice but plastic pitcher I bought from a specialty tea store down in Del Amo in L.A. And I don't like it because it gets kind of clogged up with tea leaves and stuff, even though it filters them out. I don't like that. So I got a really nice metal fine mesh filter from Snarky Teas. They have a whole kit. It's sitting here next to me. They will even send you a gallon-sized mason jar and lid that incorporates the filter. So hopefully I'm going to switch from the plastic jug because I don't like the way it gets dirty and it's extremely hard to clean. And I'm going to stop using plastics anyway. I really don't want to drink out of plastic because if I can avoid it. Ask me sometime about how nonpolar molecules bind to each other under heat. But I'm not going to do that. So I'm going over to mason jars, as I have with my cold brew coffee, where I have a nice mesh filter. Oh, I forget their name, tumbler or something like that. 
Snarky Tea, same thing. Looks like it's a better fit, frankly, for the mason jar. So I'm waiting to try all that out. In the blather, well, let's see. ASL, I think we're in week, we're in 12 or 13. I think there's 15. It's, we're getting down to the wire, so I have to tell a story in sign language to my teacher. So Thanksgiving week, I have a meeting with her. So we're running out of classes. I think we have our last quiz tomorrow night on Wednesday. And then after that, it's a final and telling a story. And I feel, oh yeah, we have to talk to her for like 30 minutes. So we'll see how that goes. I, it's, you know, a pass-fail class for me. I'm debating if I feel ready to take ASL 102 or if I want to retake this. This class was really easy up until about week nine, and then it got very challenging, and I'm still too slow. What I really need to do is practice with other speakers of ASL, which I could be doing right now in Burbank, but didn't want to drive down in the rain. Still, the pup date, Queenie and Captain are getting their choke chains, their training collars this week. So hopefully we're going to start really working intensively on good leash work because they're both very highly active, energetic dogs. And frankly, I haven't had the time. The hub state, well, there's a lovely picture of the beloved son, the Baron, eating an oversized baked cookie with a huge amount of ice cream on it. That's at Topper's. Because the one thing I've gotten from ASL is the meetings at Topper's. Topper's is actually pretty good. I can't eat their pizza, but they have a great salad bar, and they've got poppers stuffed with cream cheese and bacon, that is jalapenos, and they do not bread these, and they bake them. They're very good. They vary in their heat. Sometimes the pepper has not been scooped out very much, and it's really spicy, and sometimes it's just no seeds and very cool, but I enjoy them enormously. So we've discovered toppers, and there is my son being introduced to toppers by eating an obscenely sugar and carb laden treat, which I hope he's enjoying, frankly, until, you know, he catches up to me and gets diabetes in his 50s. Oh, that's a downer. The Hubs is doing really well with his eyes. I said the other day, boy, it's really great the way you're over that. He said, who says I'm over it? You know, he lives with a certain amount of tension and trauma, but he's doing very, very well. And I do appreciate all the supportive comments. Well, the calendar. Dun, 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 Stitches, November 11th to 13th in Pasadena. Stitches SoCal. That will be a week from yesterday. So hopefully I will be driving out there this Sunday morning and hanging out at the market and picking up my yarn from the wonderful Laura of Dizzy Blondes and visiting anybody else who's there. I don't think any of my dyers actually listen to this podcast, but hey guys, I'm coming. Jins, if you're listening, I will be there. I hope you still have my number. You certainly can text me or tweet me if you want to have lunch. Anybody else who wants to get a hug, I'll be, I'll be walking around. And, you know, if not, we'll just stand six feet apart and we'll bump elbows or shake our fists at each other, whatever. But Stitches SoCal is this week. I'm greatly looking forward to a brief spin through the marketplace. And then, frankly, I'll be down at the Pasadena Convention Center with a nice hotel room and, um, I'm staying there Sunday night, so I'm really looking forward to just getting into the hotel room and having a quiet day with television and knitting, and maybe some friends will drop by. Rome Yule, December 26th to 31st. I will be off so far. I think I have the 26th to the 30th off, but they don't know it. I'll be taking the 31st off one way or another. So, Rome Yule, we're talking about seaming the blanket, working on this year's annual Rome Yule sweater, which looks like it's blues, greens, and peaches left over from previous sweaters. So... I'm very, very excited about that, I have to admit. And I will be trying to do a million other things that I won't be getting done. <laughs> I haven't figured out if I have Christmas yarn to, new, to do socks in yet. But if I have those, I'll probably be trying to finish those. We are on schedule for the Grand Canyon. We will be uh, at the... Is that by... Um, is it called Angel's Trail? Bright Angel. Bright Angel. We'll be at Bright Angel Lodge. There we go, by Bright Angel Trail. On... June 5th through 9th, 2023. Looking forward to that. We are tentatively on schedule for Sunny Bank, which will be August 17th to 21st. I have a good friend moving out to New Brunswick, which means the way I do Sunny Bank is about to change. I'm probably not. I'm probably going to go visit her and then spend a day, day and a half at Sunny Bank. But I am deeply looking forward to seeing how that works out. Minerva gets the last word. Well, she is a multi-purpose cat. There's a picture of her. She's lying on the seat of my chair, so you can see my legs and shoes 
below her and she is chewing on her comb. Why? Well, Minerva became a fiber animal. That was not something I was expecting. But Minerva would like you to know that she fulfills many roles. One thing is she is the mouse deterrent system. When you have a cat established in your home, even if it doesn't hunt mice, mice will avoid your home if they smell the cat. So Minerva is our mouse deterrent system, which means every night she wants to go in the garage and do the rounds. She never finds or kills anything, but no mice. And it's that time of year when mice come indoors. So the mouse deterrent system function is in full swing and working. She's, of course, a fiber animal. She's, of course, a warm lap companion that she likes to sit in my lap and keep me warm. And she lets me brush her, which is soothing and lowers my heartbeat and blood pressure. So Minerva would like you to know that she sends her greetings to her cousins Nora and LaBelle. And she would like you to know that cats are multi-purpose buddies. Her other purpose we haven't figured out yet. When my husband comes near me, she jumps between us. I can't figure out if that's jealousy, if she's claiming me like any food mom has, you have to wait till I get it first, or if she thinks she's somehow protecting me. Who the heck knows? Who the heck knows? But Minerva wants you all to realize that she is the multi-purpose cat. And on that happy note, everybody remember it's that time of year, get all your shots, bring the vaccines up to date, flu, pneumonia, shingles, COVID, you got it. Just make yourself safe, okay? Take care of yourselves. Because remember, we're a community, so when we care for each other, we care for ourselves. When we care for ourselves, we care for each other. So everybody, please stay safe, take care of each other, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So we have come to the end of another episode of Cognitive. Please do not use this podcast to diagnose yourself. If you think you are having a mental health problem, please contact a licensed mental health professional. Show notes for these episodes can be found at cognitivepodcast, all one word, dot blogspot.com. Episodes can be found at iTunes under the name Cognitive Podcast, but also can be found posted next to the show notes on the Blogspot page. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.